You need to listen. I always ask students who have just come, uh, and if they're married, I always look at their husband or wife and say, how do you feel about this? It gets some interesting answers. Uh, I remember when we were uh, struggling with it, and I was speaking with the registrar on the phone, and I told him I would really be praying about God's direction. Cynthia said in the background, you pray while I pack. <laughs> so that took away all the pressure that was there. So having your spouse alongside you if you are married makes all the difference in the world. Now today I want to talk about facing your giants. Giants. Uh, it's easy to talk about giants as long as they're lumbering over someone else's landscape. But when you find them at your doorstep, or discover that one has invaded your home, or even more dangerously come inside your head, you realize how intimidating a giant can be. They have several names, these giants of ours. I, if I had the time, I would uh, rattle off 12 or 15, just, just a few to start our thinking uh, there's a giant called fear. Fear. Uh, even though most of us don't want to admit it, most of us entertain fears. If you were among those who were looking at the school, one of your fears would probably be uh, financial uh, circumstances. The fear of inadequacy. The, uh, the fear of... Uh, Academic demands. I spoke with a first-year student just before coming up to my little office here uh, shortly ago, and, and I said to her, how's it going? She said, it's more difficult than I thought it would be. And you who have not yet begun your courses here uh, perhaps entertain fears of the academic demands, and they are certainly there, though there is no reason to fear, as we will learn. And there's always the fear of the unknown, not knowing what looms out there on the horizon. And you think about it, your imagination kicks into gear, and before long, you're off and running and feeling again intimidated. There's another fear, unresolved conflicts. Maybe there are some going on in your marriage, uh, maybe in a friendship that was once strong and close. But now, because of the conflict, you're at a distance from each other. You feel fractured. Sometimes these conflicts lead to bitterness. Someone wrote that bitterness is like uh, drinking poison, thinking it will kill the other person. Uh, we are, some of people are eaten up with bitterness. You may be in that category. It is easy as we get older to have a list of enemies that we stack up, if not written down, at least in the back of our heads. Then there is the, there is the uh, giant of jealousy and envy. I, I used to battle with that, quite honestly. Most folks don't know that. Uh, Cynthia could tell you, when we were dating, I was, I was uh, filled with jealousy. I, I, I worried about the most stupid things, and as I look back, it still feels embarrassing, but uh, I don't know of any uh, sin that attacks the ministry like envy or jealousy. When you realize that God's blessing rests on certain individuals and doesn't feel like it rests on you in the same capacity, or they may have a church that's larger than your church, or their ministry may have extended beyond what yours ever will, how easy it is to feel jealous. And the giant of envy moves in and steals what could otherwise be joy and a sense of confidence and gratitude that God is using any one of us for his purposes. And of course, my list has to include lust. The fire of lust that burns in the chest of all of us. It often smolders in secrecy. Uh, it, it, it hides behind uh, 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 pornography on the internet 
or, or the hidden secrets of our hearts. Uh, some of you today are addicted to this uh, uh, giant, and it's the best kept secret. No doubt those in your own home don't even know that that giant has you cornered and has brought you under his thumb. It's frightening when you think about what that might do in the future as it gets a grip on your life and, and one day it will be found out. Or maybe the lust is simply the, uh, 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 the, the kind of lust that attaches itself to greed, another giant. And, and finally, I would list discouragement, which leads to depression. I come across that often when I speak to fellow ministers or talk to uh, students and talk to people in our church. The struggle with just discouragement, that gnawing giant that, that, that eats away at you in unguarded moments. Uh, and you can't always, in fact, you rarely can just explain how it, how it got started. But there it is again. And it hits you at the most unusual time. When you would least expect it, you fall into the, into the valley of discouragement. Or as uh, the old book says, the slew of despond. Whatever may be your giant, uh, let, me, let me tell you that I've learned over the years that giants work most effectively in valleys. When we have hit a valley, that's when the giant uh, begins to march toward us and uh, intimidates us uh, the most. There's a giant that appears in the pages of the scriptures in the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel, a story you have heard since you were a child in Sunday school. I return to this story in all honesty once or twice a year. And I just sit down and I read the 17th chapter of First Samuel. Every time I read it, I see, I see more and more. We read in verse 2 of 1 Samuel 17 that Saul and his men, the men of Israel, had gathered and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. If you're ever in Israel, you must visit this valley. The thing I noticed when I was first there, way back in my first visit to Israel, is how vast it is. I thought it would be a, a, a small valley with a little creek, but it's, uh, it's, it's enormous, uh, huge, sloping on one side and then at the, at the base where uh, apparently at one time a stream ran through and then on the other side the slope there. That, that's where they are. Uh, and what makes the valley intimidating is not the landscape. It, it, is the, it is the presence of a champion. He's called that more than once in this chapter. In fact, the emphasis always falls on the externals when you deal with giants. In this case, we read that the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side and the valley between them, then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath. Uh, I, I know you know the story. I know you're familiar with where it's going. But I want to ask you for a few moments to, uh, to put yourself in that valley and to imagine looking across the way and seeing this uh, a huge, uh, imposing individual in full armor we read that he was about nine feet, seven inches tall. I've never known anyone that tall. I, I know a number of people over seven feet tall, but I've never seen anyone even eight feet, to say nothing of almost 10 feet in height. As if that isn't enough, we read that he wore a bronze helmet on his head and was clothed with what's called scale armor that weighs about 150 pounds, just the coat of mail that went from his shoulders to his knees. And then he has these bronze 
leggings and then a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. And in addition to that, the shaft of a spear may have been like a club and the head of it was about 25 pounds and he had a shield carrier who walked before him. That's the most nervous job of the whole group. The guy that's the shield bearer for Goliath. It was, by the way, a full length shield. So he not only is armored, he has a shield to protect uh, himself from whatever you may throw at him, or so he thought. And he stood and he shouted. He, uh, uh, he continues this, we read in the chapter, verse 16, for 40 days and nights. He is screaming these words of threat. I've often looked on Goliath as the cross-eyed discus thrower. He didn't set any records, but he sure kept the crowd awake. Uh, that's, that's Goliath. I mean, he's, he is, uh, he, he's marching up and down on the other side of the slope saying, send me whoever you wish. And whoever wins will gain the mastery over uh, this country, this nation. You win, you, you own us. We win, you're, you're our slave. Giants are like that. They're they're full of intimidating words. And when they get inside your head, you you hear the screams over and over again. Even though you pray, even though you are aware and are warned of this in a a message like this one, there they are. And, 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 And you hear their voices. And he, verse 8, stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, And so why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? By the way, the tallest one on on the Israeli side is Saul, but he's not out there fighting him. Uh, Saul's a celebrity. He's not a hero. There's a real, real difference. We're going to meet a hero in a moment, but he says, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down if he's able to fight with me and kill me. We will become your servants and, and vice versa. And again, verse 10, the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel. And I'm sure there were a few curse words thrown in as well. And he took great delight in it. As you could just hear the, the armor he was wearing clanging for one day after the next, after the next. And we read, they were intimidated to the point, end of verse 11, that they gave way to dismay and fear. See it? Greatly afraid. There he is for everyone to see, mean as a, as a junkyard dog, He's a, he's a warrior from his earliest years, and he is, he, he, he's nobody to mess with. And Israel knew it, and all retreated to their, to their tents. Now suddenly the text moves us about 10, 15 miles due east to a little hamlet named Bethlehem. And there at Bethlehem, there is a family. Several of the boys are already deployed in the army and they're fighting with Saul. Or they're afraid alongside Saul. But there's one that remains. And the father, whose name is Jesse, says to this young man, David, uh, I I want you to take this to those who are in battle. And he gives gives him some supplies, some food. Verse 14 tells us that David was the youngest and the three oldest followed Saul. Uh, they, are, they are named up here in verse 13. Eliab the firstborn, Abinadab the second, and Shammah, apparently old enough to fight in the army. So he's got three boys in battle. And now he's saying to David, uh, this uh, teenager, uh, run this errand and take this over to them. Uh, understand... David has never seen the battle. He's been keeping his father's sheep, and uh, he could have been a hundred miles away and and not known less about it. Uh, And and so he he hears his father. He understands the responsibility, and so he he runs the errand, and he comes on the scene. 
and he sees this situation for the first time. This, this is an, uh, a marvelous part of the story. He, uh, he's talking there with the, uh, with the soldiers. He's near his own, his own uh, brothers, and, and he hears the voice of Goliath as he screams across the distance. And uh, David, who uh, is unintimidated, fresh out of the field, having protected the sheep, as we will read, from, from wild animals, which, by the way, that is never recorded when that happens. So all of this is happening in his private world, but that's his background. He's, he's a man of the field, he is, a, uh, he, he is a lover of God, and, and his heart is pure. And so, uh, verse 24 tells us, when the men of, of Israel saw the man, that is Goliath, they fled from here and, and, and were afraid. And they said to him, have, have, you, have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he's coming to defy Israel. Everything is external. There's not a word about the power of God. There's not a word about the protection of the land of, of the people of Israel. It is all about the giant. That happens, by the way, when a giant assaults us. And so verse 26, there's a nice refreshing change. David spoke to the men who were standing by him and said, Oh, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Uh, for, for who is this? uncircumcised Philistine that, that he should taunt the armies of the living God. How, how beautiful is that? Uh, just, a, just a brief spontaneous response. Who does he think he is? Does he know who our God is? Of course he doesn't. And, and, and the people said, well, uh, this is what will happen. Thus it will be done for the one who kills him. And, and, and they described to him the reward, which, by the way, wasn't all that great. It was Saul's daughter. That's another story. But anyway, <laughs> Eliad, I, I, like the, I, I like the brothers. We all got older brothers, don't we? Eliab, his oldest brother, heard him speak, and Eliab's anger burned against David, of all things. Eliab's not out there fighting that dude. He's back with his knees knocking in the tent, but his young runt of a brother shows up and says, who is this, this uncircumcised Philistine? You know, Eliab has a choice word for David. He said, why have you come down? Listen to this. And with whom have you left those few sheep out in the field? Makes you want to cut his lips off when you hear a guy say something like that. I'm surprised David didn't slug him. But of course, he's not the enemy. That is not the main enemy. There will always be people who will bring you down. There will always be folks who want to make you look foolish, especially when you decide you're going to walk by faith and not sight, especially when you determine you're going to have a ministry that's different. It's not based on what everyone else is doing and saying and communicating. It's based on what you know the Word of God teaches, and that's what you're going to be doing. You're committed to it. And in come the giants, and in come the friends of the giants. And who, with whom have you left those few sheep in the world? I know your, insolent, your, your, your insolence and the wickedness of your heart. You have come down in order to see the battle. There's a suggestion that it might even say, be seen at the place of battle. You, you've come so folks will think you're a big shot. David said, uh, uh, wasn't I just asking a question? I like the way the old King James renders this. Is there not a cause? You men don't, don't realize that there is a, there's a cause to fight for? Yeah. The giant wore scales, but believe me, the, the more obvious scales were those on the eyes of everyone in Saul's camp who focused on the giant. The giant. It's all about the giant. David's focus is on the Lord is God, as we're going to see. 
Verse 32, David said uh, to Saul, let, let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and, and, and will fight with the Philistines. Now listen to Saul. Saul said to David, you're not able to do it. Isn't that encouraging? I mean, it, Saul's not doing it. You'd think he'd be willing to have anybody go and give it a try. But of course, this young teenager standing in front of him, he says, you're but a youth, and, and he's been a warrior from his youth. David said to Saul, your servant, now listen to this, only time you'll know about it. David says, oh no, you don't understand, King Saul. Uh, back when I was keeping my dad's sheep, there was a lion and a bear that came and took a lamb from the flock, and I went out after him and attacked him. When's the last time you visited a zoo and got a real good look at a lion or been up in Alaska and seen a bear? You want to have a lot of distance between you and that bear you're looking at. That, they're the top of the food chain. They're the baddest things around. And he said, well, a lion come and, and look at what he, how he puts it. He said, I went after him. I went after him and attacked him and rescued it. That's the lion, lamb from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him with a beard and struck him and killed him. Oh. <laughs> no one ever would have known it if it hadn't been for that verse of scripture. And he says, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine is nothing. Compared to those four-legged animals I've fought with and God has given me a victory over, David said, the Lord who delivered me. Look at his eyes. His eyes are on the Lord. What a wonderful way to deal with giants. As the Lord delivered uh, me from the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear, well, he'll deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said, go and God bless you. Isn't that crazy? Okay, okay, but that's not all Saul says. Look at the next scene. Saul clothed David with his armor. Huh. Saul is a 58 long and David is about a 36 regular. And so he puts all of this on him. He looks like a walking garage sale from an Army Navy surplus store. He's got a helmet looking out the ear hole of it. He's got big old... Uh, Saul's armor and, and, and got big old boots on. And David, look at how it reads. I love this. He clothed him with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with his armor and girded his sword over his armor. And, and David tried to walk for he had not tested them. So David said, I, I cannot go with these. Uh, may I add that uh, you cannot fight uh, in someone else's armor. You got armored uh, men and women sitting on this platform whose lives we all respect. They don't walk on water, but I'll tell you what, they're about the best around. But it's easy to think that uh, something about them will somehow become yours by osmosis. It doesn't work like that. Someday you're going to be on your own. You won't hear their voices anymore. And you're going to be out there in your own valley. And you'll realize, I, I can't fight in their armor. And even though I respect them, uh, their stuff doesn't fit me. David said, I, I've, I've got to go with what the Lord has equipped me with. He said, I, I've not tested them. And, and so David took them off. He leaves it all in a pile and Look, this is so good. He took a stick in his hand. Isn't that great? It's a giant. He takes a stick in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in his pouch. So he takes this, he takes this pouch he's got hanging from his waist, and he puts these stones in his pouch. And, and, and we read, and he approached the Philistine. The Philistine came and, and approached David with the shield bear in front of him, and he disdained him. He was but a youth. And Philistine, verse 43, says, am, am I a dog? What is this? As a matter of fact, you are. Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed 
David by his gods. How dare he do that to God's anointed? It all flies by David. It doesn't in any way hit him. David stands there with the stones rattling in the bag on his hip and a stick in his hand. And David says to him, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. Champions never heard words like that. By the way, you've got to stand up the face of a, of, of, a, of, a, of a giant. Especially if the giant's name is legalism. You'll fight it throughout your ministry. I've learned that if I don't deal with legalists straight on, face to face, with strong words, they don't hear you. And they do their best to tear your church apart or to put people under their control. And David says to him, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and and remove your head from you. Isn't that a great line? I'm going to knock you down. I'm going to remove your head from your body, okay? (laughs) Just just want to set it straight before I do it. (laughs) Verse 49, David put his hand into the bag took from it a stone. (laughs) Can't you hear? (laughs) Thunk! Hit him right between the running lights. I mean, he fell like a sack of salt. Just like that. Gone. Now you're talking. That's really all it takes. In fact, the simple statement is verse 50. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. He didn't fight with swords. He had learned to fight with stones and a staff. That's what worked for him. And he had cultivated it. And the men of Israel and Judah rose and shouted and and, and pursued the Philistines as far as the valley and to to the gates of Ekron. And we go back to David. David, verse 54, I like this part, took the Philistine uh, head and, and, and brought it to Jerusalem. So David stands over the champion, whoo, cuts that old head off, and holds it up like this. Just, I mean, to make every Marine salivate. There it is. Look at that. There, that's what he really is. He's nothing. He's nothing in comparison to the Lord our God. And he brought the, he brought the head to to, to Jerusalem, and notice in verse 54, he put the weapons in his tent, David's tent. Don't go too quickly over this wrap-up of the battle. That's significant. What else is in David's tent? How about the paw of a bear? How about the mane of a lion or the tail? Just a reminder of those lion and bear moments when God wrought a victory through him. He put the weapons in his tent. My time is up, but uh, I brought along a bag of stones which came from the Valley of Elah. That's right. When I first uh, used this little bag of stones, I... uh, I was here at chapel, and Dr. Pentecost was sitting over here looking at me over the top of his glasses. He's been to Israel as much as Jesus, and so he's, uh, <laughs> he, he listens to me as I, as I say, uh, you know, I, I'm down there fingering, fingering these stones, and, and I'm thinking, uh, boy, maybe, maybe David looked past some of these and chose the ones he chose. How great is that? Dr. Pentecost said to me later, hey, Chuck. Yeah. So you need to know that about every month, Tel Aviv sends a dump truck down to the valley and for the sake of the tourists, drops all those stones in there. <laughs> Leave it to Pentecost to mess up a great illustration, huh? 
So I now tell people these are not David's stones, but these are stones that at least were right where he got his. Let me give you five things to remember about giants. Here we go. Number one. All giants seem larger than they really are. All giants seem larger than they really are. You think you'll not be able to uh, get control over whatever that giant is, one I named or maybe one I didn't name. It, It seems larger than it really is. It's not larger than our God. It's not larger than your Savior. Here's the second. Success in facing giants depends on how well you prepare for them. By the way, you do that in private. Uh, We're not... uh, uh, little icons sitting on public shelves, we ministers. We do our best work while no one is looking. Or we should. That's where you prepare your heart. That's where you pour out your soul. That's where you cry out for God's help and remind yourself that the battle is his. It's in private. So success in facing your giant depends on how well you prepare for that giant. Three, never forget your own lion and bear stories. Every one of you has some. I have some. They have been entered into my journal, so I'll never forget them. That's why I say to you, don't don't ever forget what God has done for you. It's a little cliche, count your many blessings. You can put it that way, but think of them as God's powerful working in and through your life. Never forget your own lion and bear stories. Remember that magnificent, impossible situation that God turned around for you. Remember that prayer that you offered in a weak faith and and by the grace of God, he answered. Most of you never dreamed of sitting in this place two, three years ago, and here you sit. There's some lion and bear stories that have gone into that. Number four, when the crucial moment arrives, remember these five words. The battle is what? The Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. The day you take on a giant in your own flesh is a day you will face defeat. All the way through this, this episode, this, this brief battle, David's focus is on the Lord his God. No wonder he's called a man after God's own heart. Everybody else focused on the giant. David realized that his God was greater than any giant. So when the crucial moment arrives, remember those five words. Learn to say them to yourself. I don't know how many times I've said the words to, to, to my own self or to Cynthia as we're driving somewhere, uh, going through a, a tough time. Let's remember, honey, the battle is the Lord's. Let's remember, this isn't our battle. This is the Lord's battle. He's the warrior. He's the triumphant one. He's the majestic one. We're nothing without him. Number five. Following every giant victory, place a reminder in your mental trophy case. Following every giant victory, place a reminder in your mental trophy case. I hope you journal. I hope you have a place where you record. You literally write down 
the way God handled whatever and slew your giant. Years ago, all of us remember the very effective life of uh, Corey Ten Boom. Remember? Remember her words when she would describe what she was going through with Betsy before Betsy's death? And then finally standing there in that death camp, not knowing what tomorrow was going to bring, she came to realize there is no pit so deep, but that he is not deeper still. May I play on that for what I'm trying to say today? There is no giant so great that he is not greater still. Please bow with me. Whether faculty member or student or guest, we all have them. Secret giants that haunt us. And could defeat us. Unless we remember greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Father, you are the powerful one. We are the weak ones. You are the potter. We are the clay. You are the master. We are the slave. The bond slave of your son, Jesus. You know the end from the beginning. We don't even know what the next hour will include. You are infinitely majestic. And we are finite. Mere human beings. Filled with the flesh. Forever focusing on what is seen rather than the unseen. Begin to deliver us from that habit, I pray, and build within us a strong determination to take on whatever may be a giant in the power of your spirit and in the majestic name.